Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the ISC retail and FMCG sectoral updates. Uh, my name is Anna and I'm event executive at the Institute of Student Employers and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Uh, hope you're all keeping safe. I know it's um, a difficult time out there, all facing high unusual situations. So really do hope everyone is successfully <laughs> navigating those uncharted waters we entered. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background into how um, these webinars work. So very shortly, I'll be handing over to Tristram Hooley, our Chief Research Officer, who will be delivering this webinar and look at the most recent data relevant to the retail and FMCG sector. Uh, Tristram will talk us through the findings from our uh, mid-season pulse survey, this development survey, and the most uh, recent coronavirus survey. Um, we will then have a Q&A session and we'll offer you the opportunity to ask questions and input your perspective. So if you do have a question, please use the question box on the right hand side of uh, your panel. I'll keep an eye on those and we will cover them at the end of the webinar. Um, we also record all our webinars, so this webinar will go online afterwards. Um, therefore, if you want to recap on anything you've heard or there is anything that you think other members of your team would be interested in, then you can pass them the link and they can view it as well. Okay, so what I would like to do now is to hand over to Tristram, who's going to take us through the latest ISC data update and share some really exciting content. Tristram, over to you. Thank you, Anna. Um, so I'm just going to talk about various bits of data that we've been collecting over the last three months, uh, which really just, which, and I'm going to try and pull out some things that are specific to the retail and FMCG sectors. Um, it's, it's a kind of a bit of a mishmash of different things, and I'll try and talk it through. If you've been following these webinars uh, closely, and I've done quite a few recently, you will have seen some of the data. Uh, I've done a little bit of new analysis that's going to draw out some things that are specific to the retail and FMCG sector. I've also got some other little bits of data towards the end as well that might be new. So um, hopefully there'll be something of interest. Basically, what I'm going to try and cover is discuss briefly the labour market outlook at the start of this year, uh, look at some key trends in development, and then look at COVID-19 as the big thing that is shaping our um, recruitment and student development sectors at the moment. Let's start with the labour market outlook. So in this figure, um, I break down the, the number of firms who responded to our um, uh, pulse survey at the beginning of the year, and we look at uh, whether they were recruiting graduates or non-graduates. And as you can see, pretty much all of them were recruiting graduates and a slightly uh, smaller chunk, so about 75%, were recruiting non-graduates. And this is um, available, this data is available on our um, uh, website. Uh, as a, We've got a series of dashboards that are interactive that allow you to look at the different data and look at them particularly from the, the view of the sector. So this is an example of that. The purple chunk here um, is the retail and FMCG sectors. So um, what this tells us is that, that pretty much all of the retail and FMCG firms were recruiting both graduates and non-graduates and um, that those those firms make up about 10% of the overall number of firms who are responding to our survey. Uh, so if we move on, one of the things that we looked at in this um, uh, research that we did over the uh, over just after Christmas was geographical changes. So we were interested in whether people were moving staff in or out of the UK and this was obviously particularly influenced by Brexit which at the time seemed like it was a really big issue for us. So we said uh, that overall about 4% of firms were moving staff into the UK but about 11% of firms were moving staff out of the UK. And we then looked at the same issue with London because we've been noticing a trend towards regionalisation and so about 9% of firms were moving staff into London and about 21% of staff were moving, of firms were moving staff out of London. If we then look at the retail and FMCG 
figures, we can see that we've got fairly similar figures. So 5% moving into the UK, 9% moving out, 5% moving into London, 14% moving out. So there is a pattern here, or at least there was at the beginning of the year, of people both moving, of more firms moving staff out of the UK and more firms moving staff out of London than are moving into the UK and into London. So we then look at the anticipated change in recruitment, and this again is at the start of 2020, and I'm going to talk about why this isn't an accurate uh, picture later on. But at the beginning of 2020, we said, how, how do you think your recruitment is going to turn out by the end of the year? And on average, there was variation by sector, but on, on average, um, people were saying that they, they were going to have see small growth, so two or three percent of growth. And that's the pattern was pretty much the same for the um, uh, FMCG sector. So that for this second chart here is just the FMCG sector. So about uh, firms predicted they were in, in your sector, uh, predicted they were going to increase the number of graduates by about two percent and really the, the number of non-graduates by about the same proportion. So what we concluded from this was that the graduate market overall was forecast to grow by 3%, but we also noted that the previous year, employers reported that they failed to fill about 3% of their vacancies. And in the non-graduate market, so the apprentice market, uh, it was forecast to grow by about 2%, but in the previous year, employers reported that they failed to fill uh, about 4% of their vacancies. So to make a guess, uh, at the beginning of the year, we thought, well, the, the market has been growing for a number of years. It seems to have largely stopped growing. And it's possible that by the end of the year, we will end up either slightly more, about the same, or slightly less than we were last year. So that was our kind of prediction. Um, so. Obviously, that that within that we have a caveat, which is well, if anything unexpected were to happen, that might change quite a bit. But but it's an important bit of context here because it tells us that at the beginning of the year we had a pretty stagnant uh, graduate and non-graduate labour market. We we did a whole bunch of work uh, throughout uh, throughout January where we put a lot of these statistics out. We got some really good coverage in the Guardian and the Times and various other places. And it, it all basically focused on this idea that, that it was possible that the overall number of graduate and non-graduate uh, jobs was going to uh, decline slightly or was going to remain stagnant. I tried to de deal with that in an article that I wrote for Prospects Luminate because I thought it, in a way the press had over, over egged that position. So my prediction then was that graduate employers will continue to be cautious throughout the rest of the recruitment season. And by the end of the year, they will have revised down their recruitment targets and recruited about the same number or slightly fewer graduates than last year. If the economy develops as predicted, we will then see modest growth next year. But if Brexit goes badly or if there is a global economic shock, all bets are off. So my prediction there was that, again, broadly, uh, the, the graduate labour market had stopped growing, but it was on track to be a roughly the same size. But obviously, we were interested in what was going to happen in the future. So I'm going to come back to that in a second when we get to the start discussion of COVID-19. But let's move to the second survey that we've done this year, which is the, the development survey. So in this survey, we look at learning and development issues and uh, the sample that we had. So about 8% of our respondents were from the retail and fast moving consumer goods sector. And that also matched with the number of, uh, of, of early career staff that this covered. So um, so around about 8% of the, of the total cohort of students that we were discussing were from the retail and fast moving consumer goods sector. So if we look at uh, the size of the development teams that a typical firm is having, we figured it out and it looked something like this. So for every learning and development professional that a firm has, they will have about seven graduates and about three non-graduates. And then obviously, depending on the length of the programme, so a typical programme is about two years. And so that will probably mean that for every learning and development professional you have, each year you're intaking around about 20 graduates. That, that was the kind of um, uh, frame that we had. Now, um, 
for retail, that was that was less, and this seems to me probably too small. Um, and some of these things, uh, uh, it gets more difficult to calculate because we're working things based on uh, the overall size of the cohort, and sometimes in some firms that can be very large. But the typical retail firm was working on about uh, four, uh, well, two uh, graduates, two non-graduates, so that's about eight, one to eight, so a ratio of about one to eight of developments, professionals, and um, uh, early career hires who you were trying to develop. Now, typical team size uh, across uh, the whole of this uh, sector was six, um, retail seemed to have more team, more staff in their learning and development teams, and that may be because, uh, and that sort of explains this um, lower level of, of rate or lower ratio that we're reporting here. Uh, and then, but they're also using contractors pretty much on a similar level as everybody else. Um, so we've got some information about um, the 70, 79% of firms are using external contractors. 82% uh, retail and fast-moving consumer goods, uh, and then 92% of firms are training their line managers, uh, and it's about 89% for retail or fast-moving consumer goods. And so they're, they're basically bringing line managers in as part of the development of early career staff. We then look at the overall budget. So the typical budget that firms uh, had for um, uh, for each each hire that they had that they're spending on their development is about five thousand almost six thousand pounds so five thousand seven hundred and thirty nine now we didn't really have good enough data from the retail sector to report this as a separate figure so I think we'll have to work with that for now um, so yeah we're working on a, an average amount that people are spending per hire uh, to develop them over a two or, or sometimes three year uh, development program of about five to six thousand pounds. Overall, when we look at the apprenticeships that that people are uh, bringing in, um, we've got a breakdown here. So apprenticeships happening at all levels, um, and then 58% of firms in general are saying that they're developing apprentices to do work that previously would have been done by graduates. When we look at the retail fast-moving consumer goods, uh, we've again got a kind of similar picture, but less at the graduate level, less at uh, uh, level seven. Um, so a more of a spread of apprenticeship levels across the different retail and FMCG um, levels. And again, about half, 44% in this case, are saying that they're developing apprentices to do work that previously would have been done with graduates. Uh, we asked about the, the length of graduate programs that people were running. So a typical graduate program runs for two years, but in the retail and FMCG, uh, that's still the typical length, but they're much more likely to be shorter than in general. So although the sort of most, the plurality, the biggest number uh, were still for two years, there were quite a lot more that were lower. Um, and then uh, if we look at how many days training, the average amount of days training that are being offered to graduates is about 19 days, whereas it's 14 in retail. And the average induction program is six days and five in retail and fast moving consumer goods. So not radically different, but in general, uh, people in the retail and fast moving consumer goods uh, sector are get, seem to be getting slightly less learning uh, and development than, uh, than others. So um, if we think about then how people are training them, they're using quite a wide range of different uh, techniques and approaches. So classroom learning, online learning, mentoring, and so on. Um, and, and the approaches are broadly similar for graduates and non-graduates, but there are some things that are more popular for uh, the, the graduates, so rotations in particular. Um, if we look at what people thought were most impactful, we see that people think classroom learning, experiential learning, mentoring, and so on were most impactful. And there are some things that are less popular uh, than in terms of saying that they're impactful than they are in terms of being use, used or commonly used. And they tend to be things like online learning and the use of, of uh, sort of qualifications as part of the training programs. We then asked about what skills employers uh, 
wanted and we get this list here which is teamwork interpersonal skills all of this the detail of this is in our um, um, in the, the report that we did around the development survey there's also a webinar that you can go back and listen to if you want to hear more about this but we get a good ranking of skills here again quite similar between graduates and non-graduates we have got some areas where there are some differences so non-graduates uh, uh, it's more likely to be something that uh, employers specify particularly is that they need to dress appropriately and that they need to have good IT skills. Um, in every other aspect they're essentially uh, more demanding of graduates than they are of non-graduates and these are probably areas where there are some issues that they think perhaps need to be um, you know they need to be sure about and they probably can make more assumptions about graduates. If we then ask about what students actually lack we get a slightly different list where employers are saying some of these more business commercial kinds of skills, so managing up commercial awareness, dealing with conflict and so on, are more likely to be the things that, uh, that their students, student hires actually lack. We then look at the areas where non-graduates are substantially more likely to lack them than graduates. We've got areas like commercial awareness, career management, self-awareness, and then these ones at the bottom that are not very big numbers, but still where their um, non-graduates are, are reporting or employers are reporting that non-graduates are considerably worse at them than graduates, so dressing appropriately, numeracy and teamwork. However, 88% agree that students uh, who have work experience arrive with better skills, but only 15% agree that students with postgraduate degrees arrive with with better skills so this is a really clear pattern it's held up over a number of surveys that we've done that employers really value experience they recognize that the experience develops the capacity of of new hires uh, they're much more um, uh, less convinced about the value of uh, postgraduate study although in some cases there are some industries where these these postgraduate degrees are a bit more important Retail and fast-moving consumer goods very much was not one of them. It was it was very uh, rare for for employers within that sector to say that they valued postgraduate degrees, but many many of them said that they did value work experience. Uh, and then we look at the things that employers are actually concentrating on development. We've got things like presentation skills, commercial awareness, job-specific technical skills, teamwork, and so on. So. There are some areas where we see that employers are much more likely to be developing the skills that graduates have than the skills that, that non-graduates and apprentices have. So these are areas like negotiating and influencing skills, leadership, dealing with conflict, managing up and so on. So if we, if we wanted to sum those up, there's a very clear pattern that employers still view graduates as being uh, who they will train up to do future leadership and sort of more senior and strategic roles in comparison to non-graduates. So that may be something that we'll want to look at over a number of years and see whether that changes, but there still seems to be a pretty clear pattern on that. However, when we look at the things that they're more likely to train non-graduates on, they tend to be somewhat more kind of remedial in nature. So they're kind of trying to address weaknesses. So staying positive, dressing appropriately in numeracy, of the areas where they're more likely to train non-graduates than graduates. If we then look at retention, what we can see is that overall retention uh, for both groups is pretty high. So if you go to work for one of the ISE's employer after five years, you're still probably going to be working for them, whether you're a graduate or a non-graduate. Um, and if you're a non-graduate, you're you've got almost 70% chance of being still working for, for, for that firm after five years. Um, if we then look at some sectoral variations, we can see that the retail and fast moving consumer goods is sort of not right at the bottom of the pack, but it's, it's quite near the bottom of the pack. So you, you have more issues with retention within this sector than, than most other sectors. Um, and it, it kind of gets worse over time. So after five years, you're kind of well under 60% uh, for graduates. And if we then look at non-graduates, it's somewhat better, but you're still sort of around about the middle there, in fact. Um, so you're, you're, you're you know, just on maybe 65%, something like that, after 
five years. So there were some interesting findings that we had about uh, how certain types of hires were more difficult to retain than others. So uh, women, black or Asian ethnic minority students, um, people with mental health issues, these were some of the groups that employers particularly highlighted as being more difficult to retain. And we also asked, what were the reasons why people leave? And we start to see reasons like career change, uh, poached by another company, dissatisfaction with, with progression. And then as the fourth one, we see dissatisfied with pay. And generally pay is not coming up as a particularly important reason. There's a lot of other reasons that firms argue are more important or are more likely to lead to people leaving. And that's not that surprising because the pay increases that these graduates and non-graduates were getting over a, a three year period at the firm were pretty substantial. So graduates were typically earning about 11,000 more, non-graduates about 8,000 more. So if we look at the, that in particular to the sector, and let's look at the retail and fast moving consumer goods, um, based on our recruitment survey, you were saying you were appointing your average graduate of about 27,000 pounds. And after three years, they're gonna be earning around about 40,000 pounds. You're appointing your average non-graduate around about 16,000, and after three thousand, after sorry, after three years, they would be earning about 27,000, so about the same as your graduate entrance. So, if this is right, it looks like it's a pretty um, positive picture in terms of salary. Now, obviously, there will be questions going forward whether those uh, sort of progression routes hold up as strongly, and that brings us on to the discussion of COVID-19. Now, I've been talking about this quite a lot recently. And again, there are webinars, uh, podcasts, and a report that you could look at that will tell you a bit more about this. Um, but let's look in a bit more detail at some of the issues that are coming. I haven't got sectoral uh, data here, so I'm just gonna present very briefly some of the, the um, whole graduate and non-graduate labor market data that we have, the student recruitment uh, data that we have. If we do another survey, which we may well do, we probably will look at sectoral differences as well. So what we've seen is that the survey closed a little while ago, and since then, quite a lot has changed. So I won't go through this in great detail, because what I've done here is look at the progress of COVID-19 over the last few weeks, well, really since uh, the end of January, when it really first came to the UK. And you can see when our survey was taking place, it's kind of in the middle, but it was before the real acceleration in the number of cases. So we were really just at the beginning of recognizing that this was a crisis. So the data that we've got is helpful. It gives us indications of what direction employers are moving in. It is not the kind of final or current picture. So what we found when we asked about working practices, uh, we found that even before the lockdown was official, we saw that employers were in large numbers were trying to get rid of um, uh, phone meetings, sorry, trying to get rid of face-to-face -face meetings, moving things online, trying to work from home more, uh, reducing travel and so on. So these things have uh, you know, been in many ways overtaken by events. When we asked them more specifically about recruitment approaches, what we saw was that most of the kind of attraction side of recruitment was being uh, cancelled and closed down. So people weren't going to careers fairs, weren't visiting universities. Uh, we only asked about the face-to-face -face stuff. We assumed that the uh, online stuff was was continuing pretty much as, as before. Uh, but what we saw was that where employers were putting most of their efforts was in trying to um, manage the re actual selection, recruitment and selection processes and in those cases, so assessment centers and face-to-face -face interviews, we were seeing empl employers moving their existing face-to-face -face processes online. So we also have seen in terms of learning and development programs, some substantial changes. So um, employers are generally changing how they deliver, moving more stuff online. There's some delaying uh, of learning and development programs but very few are actually canceling their learning and development programs. So learning and development is going on. It might be being delayed. It might be uh, being um, managed in a, a, a different way, perhaps online, but it isn't being um, actually uh, dealt with. Um, it isn't being kind of canceled altogether by and large, or at least that's what we heard 
when we first uh, first did this survey. Most importantly, though, we asked about how were how were employers planning to change their hiring, and what we saw was that there was about a quarter of employers who were looking to reduce uh, their hiring, um, and then about you know a third to to forty percent who were planning to continue as planned. And then a really important group, the third, who was saying at that time that they didn't know what was going to happen. They weren't sure what they were going to do. And one of the key questions is, do those don't knows start to move into the decrease level? Now, what we've been hearing so far, uh, I'll move on to this in a second. What we've been hearing so far is that many, many firms are cancelling summer placements and internships at the moment very few firms are actually uh, rap rapidly or massively reducing their recruitment for September. But I think there are still a lot who are in the holding pattern and still figuring out what they're going to do. So what we are starting to see is due to COVID-19, immediate decisions to shift recruitment patterns and to um, cancel summer placements. Sometimes firms are replacing that with other things. Sometimes they're doing it online. But in many cases, they are just cancelling them. And then we're also seeing a series of um, decisions that are being made uh, about uh, in terms of uh, what's going to happen with the recruitment that's going to happen in August and September that are still, I think, very much ongoing. So just to say something from some wider recruitment uh, data that we have. So this is from EMSI. They, they've got a webinar happening tomorrow if people are interested. Um, it's well worth signing up. They also provide this dashboard. Uh, this is not uh, student labor market data, so it's not just about entry level, but it, it gives us some useful indications of what's going on. So that's why I'm showing it to you. Um, what we can see is that there's been a massive drop off in recruitment in general. So this is based on the number of online job adverts that are being posted. And if we look at how that breaks down for retail and fast moving consumer goods, we can see that one of the biggest areas um, where we're seeing changes in um, in uh, actual recruitment is in the sales and customer service occupations, which are being uh, you know have had seen a very big decline uh, from the from the beginning of the month. Essentially, about ten thousand less sales and customer service occupation adverts than you might perhaps have expected. Um, and in fact, that that is one of the biggest areas where people are uh, actually cutting. If we look at the, this, uh, these other charts over here, they tell us which, which occupations are growing and which occupations are um, shrinking or which are adding the most adverts and which are shrinking. So we can see that there are food and drink and tobacco process operatives, so making food and uh, large goods vehicle drivers, so logistics and lorry driving and so on. These are, are growing. There's also some, uh, some posts for um, uh, merchandisers and window dressers, so that would be shop assistants and things would be in there. And then we've got undertakers, mortuary and crematorium assistants and hospital porters in a much more worrying thing. And then we've got retail and checkout. So these areas are growing, which are perhaps the things that you might expect to be growing, but there's evidence that they are growing. Uh, on the other end, we've got some areas that are um, that are being, you know, that are seeing big uh, declines. So um programmers chefs sales and account and business development managers so there, there are a number of areas that are growing a number of areas that are shrinking but overall we're seeing a pretty substantial contraction of the labor market during this immediate period it's not clear at the moment how long term that is it's not clear that it will affect one sector more than another but some of this data starts to give us some clues about where it might affect and some of the things where we're seeing increases are probably quite short term. Now, the bigger economic picture that we've got, uh, this is from The Guardian today. It tells us that the FTSE 100 posted the largest quarterly fall since uh, the Black Monday aftermath. Um, so it's, it's looking quite grim, the overall economic picture. Obviously, the government is doing quite a lot about that. There's a lot of people thinking about this. Um, we're not sure how it's all going to play out, but there is certainly some very negative signs from the wider economy at the moment. So my summary in terms of where we are with COVID-19 is that we're still at the beginning of this crisis. We've uh, seen face-to-face -face attraction cease. 
We've seen selection moving online. We've seen summer interns cease. In the medium term, the, the September graduate and apprentice numbers are still quite unclear. Reduction's quite likely, I think. Um, much will depend on how long restrictions stay in place. And in the longer term, I think a wider economic downturn is quite possible. And if this impact, if this actually happens, it may impact on hiring numbers in 2020 and 2021, as well as the, the future years. So there, there's some reason to be concerned. In terms of the implications, I think COVID-19 is clearly driving change in all sectors. Firms are shifting online and we're seeing new ways of working emerging, but there's an impending crisis for young people entering the workforce this year and probably next year as well. And there's a considerable danger of recession. So the government is acting, but if it's, if it's gonna make an impact, it's really probably got to do rather more than it currently is doing. There's more information about all of our surveys, including the full access to these surveys on our website, on these publication pages. I'll also highlight the fact that we've just created a new COVID-19 bulletin, which we're gonna try and put out every week. Um, this is just a kind of an example of what we're doing in it. You can find it on our website uh, through the news, industry news phase uh, section of our website. And then here's a bit of information about me. So, I'm happy to take any questions that people have got at this stage that, that people might find helpful. Yeah, thank you, Tristram. That was really useful content. Yeah, just so to remind you that you can ask and type in your questions into the question box. Uh, it should be on your right hand side in the control panel. Um, so, yeah, please do ask them. Um, so we've got a question from Rosa. Um, Rosa says, hi, I saw you held a town hall for employers in the sector. What were the themes discussed? Any insights to share? Anna, I think you're probably in a better position to answer that than I am, because I think I think you were there and I wasn't at the town hall. Uh, yes, I do have the insights, some of it I can share. Uh, after the the webinar we'll have to have a look because we had so many of them that i can't remember from the top of me i have to be honest with you um what was exactly discussed but you know um it was mainly the apprentices i think um so yeah i i would i would have to have a look uh, and double check but i'm ha happy to share it one of the things that i'm going to try and do in this covid 19 bulletin that we're producing every week is just to produce uh, a, a brief and sort of anonymized summary of what's been going on in the town halls. Um, so I'm trying to get uh, information from people because we're getting a lot of really useful data from employers at the moment who are talking about some of the issues that they're experiencing. Now, obviously we have to present that in a pretty anonymous and high level way. So I probably won't be providing detailed uh, data at a sector level, but what we are gonna try and do is put a number of bullet points. So last week, um, if I just go, um, so last week, the sort of things that we um, discussed was the fact that we we were seeing this um, in a number of the town halls, we were seeing people talking about cancelling and changing their summer internships. And we, was, and we also heard that people haven't made decisions about their September numbers. So that's the kind of thing that I'm, I'm going to be sharing. So if you watch our um, bulletins, you should be able to see where we're getting to with some of those things. Thanks, Tristram. Do we have any other questions? Just going to wait a second. Uh, Rosa is asking, do you think employers in the sector would benefit from localised discussions with universities? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think we've, we're seeing um, my understanding is that many university employer engagement teams are already engaging quite uh, in, in you know, quite a lot of detail with, with employers. I think there are a number of issues that need to be discussed in those discussions. So the, the first and most kind of critical one is, you know, actually what's happening? Are you cancelling, um, you know, summer internships, for example, because the universities will probably have to help manage that with the students who are supposed to be on those calls or on those um, uh, programs. 
but uh, I think there's an, a bigger issue, which is um, how, how is recruitment going to work next year? And I, I think one of the questions is whether, you know, it, it would be my guess that, that people will, at the very least, be offering fairly substantial contingency plans for the idea that we won't be able to go back immediately in September to the normal way of working with employers coming onto campus, careers fairs, and so on. So I think universities will be figuring that out at the moment. Employers are also going to be thinking about what their recruitment plans are for next year, and it's really important the two of them connect up and have those conversations. Uh, Toby is asking a question. I think, Toby, your question has been cut, because uh, all I can see is, can understand why you need to keep things general. If we want industry-specific effects of dot 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 <laughs> so if you want to uh, finish yeah i mean yeah. Well, just to say that i, I think it, if we're talking about oh, i've you, got the question you know, hello sorry for the strong i've got the end of the i've got the end yeah. part of the question so um if we want industry specific effects of covid 19 on individual sectors can you recommend any additional sources other than emsi um, so, all right, so the first thing I would say is that um, for employers, we would like employers to join the town hall meetings. And, and inevitably, that has to be confidential conversations that employers are having. Where there are clear patterns coming out of it, I will try and surface those patterns and make them available more widely to the ISE membership. Absolutely. Um, having said that, I think we're still in a period when there aren't very clear um, distinctions between the way in which different sectors are re relating to this. We are, you know, because most of the problems that people are having are pretty universal. That, you know, the whole economy has been shut down pretty much with a few exceptions. And so, so I don't think there are really massive um, sectoral differences at the moment. I think those sectoral differences will emerge over the next few months. And as they do, we will do more, more research things like the um, emsi which i sh shared with you is a useful place to look um obviously um you could look at, at some of the trade press in the different sectors as well um so retail news and these kinds of things if you're interested in the retail sector but my sense is at the moment we're not seeing very big sectoral differences but those those differences will emerge over over the summer probably Thank you. Can't see any more questions. Uh, let me just wait a few more minutes. So just to remind you as well that this um, webinar is being recorded um, and it will be available on our website in the events and webinars um, section of the IC uh, web page. Okay, well, I think we've covered all the questions uh, that people ask online, but if you do have any additional questions or comments, you can always follow up with Tristram direct, directly. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you for your time today, and thank you, Tristram, for a great session. Um, and everybody, please stay safe and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.